Let's get started. So hi, everyone. My name is Jason Key uh, at SB Grid, Harvard Medical School. So today we are uh, privileged to have Pavel Penchek uh, joining us from uh, UT and at Houston Medical School. And Pavel is going to be talking to us about single particle EM computational challenges. So with that, Pavel, whenever you're ready. Yes, uh, thank you for the introduction. I guess it was somewhat brief, so maybe I will just add a few words about my own uh, prowess. Uh, I was in the field of a single particle EM, seems to be precise, 1989, which is virtually the beginning of the field. I joined as a young postdoc a group of Joachim Frank, who is currently considered one of the if not the father of the field. And it was actually his group uh, already in the 80s, if not late, late 70s, that started working on, uh, on methodology. So when I joined his group, uh, there was just a major breakthrough that uh, he accomplished, which was preparation of cryo, which is preparation of protein in uh, nearly native condition. And he was just looking for somebody willing to work on this data, which proved to be quite challenging. I found the problem interesting. So as an outcome, I stayed with Yakin uh, eventually as a, as a research scientist for about a decade. And then eventually I moved to uh, Texas where I run my own group, continuing on whatever I picked up from uh, Joachim. So with this introduction, um, this is the system check. What is single particle cryo EM? So the, the way I uh, organize this presentation, I assume that uh, you guys know little if anything about uh, cryo EM. So, I will give a rather broad introduction of what do we do, what can we accomplish, and then say a few words about uh, software, how is it organized, and finally jump to what, in my view, are currently the main challenges, which I hope might be of interest for you. So the name conceived way back in the 70s was single particle cryo EM. And one of the buzzwords, buzz terms that was used was crystallography without crystals. It was noted that electron microscope can deliver, at least theoretically, very high resolution, rivaling those of X-ray crystallography. However, electron microscope just takes a picture of whatever is uh, put into it. Therefore, the hope was that one could determine somehow three-dimensional structure of small proteins without the necessity of uh, to grow crystals, which as we all hopefully agree is always a challenge. So uh, what are the requirements of the technique? Obviously, the protein is soluble. Yes, we, we, we have to be able to purify it and maintain it in the buffer uh, uh, so it can be imaged. Therefore, ideally, buffer contains multiple copies uh, of the same protein, which is structurally intact. And these copies are have this single particle form. Obviously, the protein has to have structural integrity, meaning all these proteins have to represent the same object, or so we hope. Yes, the idea is that once we have these multiple, multiple copies of a single protein, we can somehow um, computationally bring them together and create a three-dimensional model. Actually, it's not a model, it's the actual reconstruction, as we will see in a second. So uh, the limitation uh, unfortunately, is the si size. Uh, the EM data turns to be of rather poor quality. And in order to see the protein, it has to have certain size. Uh, this might be an older slide. I put here 300 kilodaltons. Uh, most recently, due to many technological improvements, the limitation seems to be going down and we're looking currently at objects which are barely above 100 kilodaltons. However, uh, for beginners, it, it's safe to be on a big size, the bigger the better. So um, here it's a very simple <clears throat> recapitulation of what I just said. 
I hope I have a pointer here. Yeah, I do. No, I do not. Yes. In any case, uh, so what we see here is ideally idealized uh, picture. So we have objects suspended in frozen buffer. Yes, the objects have to be frozen. Otherwise, in electron microscope, they would just um, evaporate. The column of the microscope is maintained under strict vacuum conditions. And electron beam passes through them. All of that is done such all the settings are adjusted that what we get at the end are linear projections of the objects. What that means is that the dose has, has to be kept within a certain range and um, the uh, ice layer which we see here has to be reasonably thin. So once we have multiple projection images of these objects, all what we have to do is somehow arrange them in 3D and obtain a three-dimensional structure. So this is the whole process. So obviously we start from biochemical preparation, which is purification. Uh, luckily for us, the requirement uh, as far as the purity and quality of the prep goes are not as stringent as those for crystallography. However, I would um, volunteer to say that best recon reconstructions are done using preps um, prepared by crystallographers who know this part very well. So there is no harm in purity of the complex. So once we have something which is reasonably prepared, the first step is shock freezing of the grids. Yes, so the sample is deposited on the grid and rapidly blob, uh, dropped into liquid ethane. So it's rapidly frozen. Yes, this sample is now transferred into a column of electron microscope, which is this large thing that we see on the left, and the pictures are taken. Originally, the data was collected, what, what we see this round uh, brownish thing is a phosphorus screen. So this used to be to observe the data, and the pictures were taken on film. However, all of that now is taken over by digital methodology, meaning what we see at the bottom, this, this, this long column, is a digital camera. All of that is done digitally and the results can be immediately uh, examined on the computer screen on the right. In addition, currently microscopy is relatively easily automated, meaning the sample is inserted, general conditions are set, computer takes over and over a span of 10, 24 or even more hours, images are taken and transferred to storage. Again, we have to keep in mind that that generates enormous volume of data. Why this is necessary, I will explain later. The data is transferred there, there to um, computational analysis and here I put this modest cluster because indeed the computation, uh, the computational part, due to the volume of the data and uh, also complexity of the process, takes significant amount of time. Uh, it's not only the time of calculation itself, but the necess necessity of the user to interact with with the software and steer it in the right direction. So projects can take anywhere from weeks to month, if not years, of uh, computational effort. Eventually, if you're lucky, we obtain a structure somewhere nearing atomic resolution at about three angstroms, 3.5, as most recent uh, results demonstrate. Uh, however, still a lot of work is done by uh, is uh, is done at relatively low resolution 20 30 angstroms it's low by standards of x-ray crystallography or nmr however because we are often looking at large complexes much useful information emerges so going back to um, computational principles what do we have to do so what electron microscope does as i said under reasonable setting is a linear projection. So what we have on the left is a three-dimensional object 
And what it means mathematically, we can imagine that the object is sliced, and this is what is shown at the center, and then electron beam passes through it, yes, and accumulates densities through, uh, from all these uh, slices. In simple words, the densities, yes, these bright spots from all slices are added, so three-dimensional information is collapsed to 2D information on the right, and this is what we have. In mathematical terms, this is called integral transform because three-dimensional object is integrated over Z direction, yes, and what we get is 2D projection. So the thing to be uh, to keep in mind is that projection is not a shadow version of the three-dimensional object. It actually contains all densities, only collapse. So then we use tomography principle, which is the same one which is used in a CAT, yes, a computerized axial tomography or NMR tomography, meaning from projections we reconstruct three-dimensional object, and this is a large mathematical field how to do it. Uh, in simple terms, each of the projections which here are put on a circle are back projected into initially empty volume. By back projected, I mean each pixel into the object is smeared in along a line, respective line, into this 3D uh, volume, and all these smeared um, back projected lines are eventually added. So even this simple description immediately tells us that whatever has uh, high density in projections will have high density in 3D. Both steps, if done properly, are linear, meaning what we get at the end is exactly, or to a very good approximation, the original three-dimensional object. As you can easily guess, the difficulty was the, what distinguishes single particle EM from almost all other applications of tomographic principles is that, unfortunately, we do not know the angles. Here, I, what I'm showing is simplified in a sense. They are arranged proper, uh, properly, but as you will see in a moment, in actual work, we don't know these angles. So this is the major, major problem. So again, this is the whole process, and what I was showing is uh, the part on the right, yes, that all these views, all these uh, three-dimensional particles shown in the water, actually it's ice layer, yes, are projected and generate projections at different angles shown in lower right uh, corners, yes. The difficulty is that because we want to maintain linearity and we don't want to damage our specimen, which is really fragile, yes, electrons carry enormous amount of energy, we have to take pictures maintaining very low dose, and this is about what we would get. This is an older electron micrograph, and mm, what you can see here is that there is little to be seen. Uh, the dark spots which you can see for example in upper right corner are actually not pictures of a protein this is contamination however i know for a fact that the protein is somewhere here these are pictures of ribosomes and by squinting a little bit uh, we, you could probably see traces of them however those that are that are very dark uh, mm, spots are simply uh, this is simply contamination so this is the challenge. The data is of very poor quality. And I would add to it that there are two parts to it. One is just what I demonstrated, that the signal to noise level is very poor. However, if that was the only problem, we could deal with it. And one can show on simulated data that actually it's not that difficult to obtain full 3D information from data at this signal to uh, signal to noise ratio level. But there is another problem which actually is much more challenging, which is the original assumption, if I can go back to origin to, to, to first slides, that all these projections represents represent the same 
in principle the same object. Actually, this is really true and proteins are almost never entirely identical. Moreover, many of these images are damaged, these projections are damaged in strange way, they may be missing parts. So as far as it's easy to simulate the data at certain signal to noise ratio level, as long as the noise is additive, the other aspect is virtually impossible to simulate because it's not random and it depends on many factors. So I would consider the second problem much more challenging. In addition, there is yet another factor, which is not so much the challenge, but something to take into account and which explains the poor quality of the data, which is the microscope has very particular transfer function. Transfer function tells us uh, how much information is passed by the optical system or imaging system as a function of spatial frequency. Normally transfer functions have Gaussian shape, meaning a low frequency is passed very well and as frequency increases the amplitudes are suppressed. This is mm, typically the case. What is really unusual about electron microscope is that image that transfer function has this sinusoidal shape and quite unfortunately it uh, goes to zero at low frequencies yes so we have this sine shape and in panel a we see two-dimensional power spectrum so we get this interesting uh, pattern of thunderings uh, sorry of um, of intensities yes so now um, if this kind of transfer function is applied to the image uh, shown in panel C, what we see is um, shown in, in panel D. This is what we collect at the electron microscope. And in, at a very good approximation, image D is a special spatial derivative of image C. And this is the, the this, um, this is uh, the outcome of this fact that the CTF, the transfer function, goes in low frequencies linearly to zero. So approximately, it's a spatial derivative. The take home message is that EM pictures contain very little in terms of low frequency. They're very good or can be very good in high frequencies, but not so much in low frequencies. And that creates enormous challenge uh, for initial work because it's very difficult to establish the initial low resolution structure since, as I'm saying, we don't have this information or very little and it's not reliable in in the range of low frequencies. So the field was developing for over two decades as I said now if, if not three there was a lot of effort done already in the 80s the first three-dimensional reconstructions appeared in late 80s and then as I was saying the first cryo reconstructions from these very well preserved data were done uh, in uh, Joachim's Frank group and um, in early 90s. And this was the first reconstruction of a ribosome, which was a significant accomplishment. So slowly, slowly, a knowledge how to how a typical project should uh, proceed was built up, and this is made systematic. Um, uh, this is shown on this uh, diagram here. So what I show here are um, are major steps of the process. So what we have at the beginning is of course EM data collection. This is an older slide, so it still shows film. In fact, most of the data is collected now on digital cameras. Then we analyze the micrographs, which are these large fields for the content of information. So this is power spectrum. Then, of course, we want to pick up particles, these tiny invisible objects. And then we have to 
align them, as I will show in a moment, they appear in all sorts of orientations. So most of the work that is spent on EM is on alignment, or as it is called in other image processing fields, on image registration. Yes, we have to make them all appear in about the same orientation, so eventually we can average them and build up signal to noise ratio. So then we jump after these steps of 2D analysis to the initial model. And this is the challenge, as I said. So I list here a good number of methods how to obtain it. Some of them go outside of single particle field because as I was saying, single particle cryo images have very little uh, low frequency information. So occasionally we resort to other techniques which are partially experimental which are much more robust once we have this initial model we can now use high quality em data and perform a step which is called 3d refinement meaning we go from low resolution to high resolution whatever the data can deliver and finally there will be some kind of analysis of 3d map we have to make sense out of it, which, especially if the map is of limited resolution, might be challenging because we will just get a set of blobs, sort of like you see here on the right, there is no secondary structure. This is by no means a, a crystallographic quality result. However, this is some kind of arrangement of subunits or uh, proteins within this uh, complex. And the challenge is to identify them. Actually, the picture of a project, if we think about design of a software package, is much more complicated. And I will not go through this uh, diagram. This is uh, was put together as a training thing. But the main point is that it would be unusual for the project to proceed in a linear manner. As I said at the beginning, during computation and analysis, the user will often backtrack because it turns out that the parameters that were used were not good or the data was not uh, well prepared or well collected. So what you see in this, um, in this diagram are major feedback arrows, yes, that lead the um, researcher to the beginning of the project. Very often purification has to be repeated, new data has to be collected, and even within the uh, computational part, which is the right, right leg of this thing, which again implies that it's done linearly, it's really not so. To focus on initial 3D map, we may get this 3D model from somewhere, only to realize that it's not going anywhere and it's likely to be incorrect, yes? So then we have to backtrack somewhere to, to the images or to the averages and see what we can correct or what mistakes were made. This immediately suggests that single particle EM software packages tend to be complex because they have to deal with all these issues. And ideally, they would be supported by a database which would allow user to uh, track the steps, uh, the steps that were made. So this is already the <clears throat> intermediate step, meaning I what I show here are class averages obtained by uh, alignment, meaning many individual images were brought into register, and then a clustering uh, algorithm was applied to separate them into supposedly uh, homogeneous groups. So these groups now, these are class averages that we would call them, due to averaging on one hand and have largely improved signal to noise ratio. I hope there is no dispute that mm, shapes can be easily recognized. On the other hand, because of all the uncertainties built into this uh, project, there is no doubt loss of resolution. They don't show all that many details. However, this is how it typically proceeds. And mm, this is done using 
uh, in this particular case, a rather complicated strategy that was developed in my group about five years ago, which was mainly uh, directed at a question how one can be sure that these class averages are actually correct, that they were not obtained by chance. Typically, this step was done using algorithms from the class of k-means. For those of you who know what that means, we'll also realize that k-means, while uh, generates very nicely class averages, has uh, very little validation built into it, will always produce some kind of classes, but it's an open question whether uh, they are homogeneous, meaning whether they contain objects of the same class. Uh, so, uh, what we did in development of ISAC, this, this major, uh, major method, is a validation step which looks at individual classes and check, checks whether they can be reproduced, meaning whether repeated alignment will generate the same class averages and thus hopefully eliminate those that were obtained just by chance. So this is extremely computationally demanding. However, it delivers very high quality and even more importantly, reliable uh, class averages. So <clears throat> once we have these class averages, as I said, the question is, how are they arranged in 3D space? And quite interestingly, um, very few people have very good have good 3D imagination. It's very difficult just looking at the shapes to uh, these these 2D um, images to uh, come up with a three-dimensional shape which may produce them. The other difficulty is that these are, as I said, projections. These are not um, these are not shadows of the structure, which makes things even more complicated. So the problem of as we say, ab initio 3D structure determination haunted the field for a very long time. So on one hand, there is a, mm, there is a number of semi-experimental techniques where one would go back to the microscope and collect, say, tilted data. Yes, by tilting the data, we are getting closer to what is done in uh, standard computerized uh, tomography because some angles are determined by the uh, uh, by the uh, by the experiment and that leads to a much more reliable initial models however they tend to be of very poor of very poor quality so the hope was always to um, develop methodology which is purely computational and from this gallery can deliver a 3D object. So here I will not go into details, but again, the question is, it's not that difficult to generate some kind of a 3D model. Anybody can do it. Yes, we can just assign some kind of angles to all these projections or make them up or use some kind of a simple strategy and a model will appear. And what, what you see at the top is just that, yes? The program just took guesses and generated six models. I hope you would agree that it's very difficult by looking at them to decide which one might be correct. So what we use here in the strategy, which we call Viper, which was recently again developed in my group, which is aimed at ab initio structure determination, uh, we develop this strategy which is based on genetic algorithm, meaning a program will start from a number of educated uh, guesses, in this case the population is six, and then try to refine them and at the same time mix them up. Yes, as for those familiar with genetic algorithms, will be, it's hopefully clear what I mean. In simple words, um, these initial six structures are connected into pairs and let's say simply averaged yes and they generate what in ga parallel we call offsprings and now we see that the shapes which were initially messed up uh, were initially sort of nice now became messed up however they provide 
new starting points for the next generation for the next step of the uh, of refinement and as you will see as you see here already in generation two the algorithm came to a consensus meaning decided that all the structures converge to about the same shape actually it's not the same at this point it will do a couple of more generations but there is no doubt that it reached a consensus and you can compare the lower line from the uh, lower row from the top one to see that actually the left one on the top was already a good guess it wasn't perfect but it was almost there yes but what the algorithm does is by exploring a good number of them uh, um, provides a measure of um, of reliability to the final outcome right so this is the original thing again computationally expensive because number of structures have to be processed however at this point we use these class averages so the number of images that we process is very very low it's no more than 1000 to the images that go into these reconstructions so that's why a lot of exploration can be done the final step of the structure determination is the initial structure uh, uh, sorry is the refinement of the original structure to high resolution and the idea is that we would take one of these models shown on the previous slide yes and doing something add details to it by this time using original raw data not averaged and using um, a lot of it yes so the principle this is a methodology that i developed in the early 90s and um, it is still used by virtually all uh, single particle software packages in this form or another the principle is very simple we have this three-dimensional template structure which originally is at low resolution and then computationally we calculate its projections or in this case they are called reprojections yes because we reproject the uh, the template so that yields a very large number of 2d templates images which is what we would expect from the experiment if the structure on the left was correct at the center we have a stack of particle images and this time this is raw data so the number is very large easily into hundreds of thousands and now it's the tough part computationally tough because we have to align each of these raw images to each of the templates so just to um, give put it in perspective we have hundreds of thousands of raw images these at the center are very noisy now and thousands of templates images generated from the structure so the complexity is one number times another and in addition it's a alignment step two images have to be brought into register and each time correlation coefficient is registered once we have all correlation coefficient for each raw image we can find the maximum and that tells us immediately what were the eulerian angles used to generate corresponding uh, corresponding template image so this simple strategy assigns eulerian angles or orientation parameters to experimental raw data once we have these orientation parameters now we can use 3d reconstruction algorithm to generate a map we can now analyze it spruce it up low pass filter and plug it in uh, on the left and we iterate this whole process until such time that the structure does not improve anymore or develops some kind of um, uh, artifacts at which point we we will stop all right so that's the uh, that's the main process finally finally um, as i said most of the time the structures obtained are not most of the time but very often are at res relatively low resolution 
by which I mean resolution at which uh, secondary elements are not visible, cannot be detected, and that typically means less than seven, eight angstroms. So what you see here is probably done at around 20 angstroms. And again, these uh, class averages shown at the top in the white frame, not very many, were used to generate the structure, slightly refine it, it didn't go very far, and now is the main step very very often we will support ourselves by crystallographic mm, uh, by results of x-ray crystallography because x-ray crystallography is much more successful in structure determination of small complexes so individual proteins here as you will see as you see were determined by x-ray crystallography they are shown in different colors and then again we can use computational techniques. Here it was just done by eye because it's kind of obvious. They were placed into a 3D density map and that greatly simplifies the interpretation. Moreover, puts a lower level, so to say, or lower scale crystallographic um, results into um, a framework of the actual functional uh, biological macromolecule. So this is the process. Now, I will switch to software, how it is constructed or what it actually does. I hope it was clear by now that actually in terms of image processing, we don't use that much. There are only two major techniques that we use, correlation functions for uh, orientation of images or volumes and 3D reconstruction from 2D projection data. So if we take a textbook on image processing, we realize that this is a small part of it. There are also some other things, but actually not that much. What makes it challenging, as I said at the beginning, is the poor quality of the data. And that's what makes the work uh, interesting because it's very rare that methodology taken from a textbook would work. It requires major effort to make it applicable to the data of this quality. And second, we have general requirement of linearity of the methods that we use. So again, if we open a textbook on image processing, we will see maximum likelihood, uh, sorry, not maximum likelihood, maximum entropy and this and that very sophisticated methods. However, and very often people coming from outside of the field will be very enthusiastic, but then um, the disappointment is that um, we do not really use them. The reason is very simple. We maintain linearity in the experiment. As I said at the very beginning, the microscope is set such that the pictures are linear projections. What it means in mathematical terms is that the these brightness numbers that we observe are linearly related to the density of the protein and at the end of the day to atomic numbers that uh, compose it. So given that, after we go through this whole process, the 3D map better has the same property so it can be interpreted in terms of protein density. If we say uh, square the map, it's not that obvious what these numbers mean anymore. So in simple terms, we try to stick to simple methods which mm, maintain linearity all the way through. So because actually the methods that are used are not that complicated, especially nowadays with much better understanding and more sophisticated software development tools, it's not that difficult to quickly write something which will do single particle reconstruction, meaning will perform some kind of steps. So <clears throat> over the years, there was a number of uh, packages developed. The two first one, the first one was actually Spider 1981, as I said, that was developed in a group of Yakin Frank, and I made significant contributions to it uh, in the 90s. So this was the first one. Very quickly, another one appeared, Imagic. Both are written in Fortran. 
Um, immediately, I have to introduce a major distinction between these packages. Spider was thought of as a general purpose image processing package. So one can think about it as a scripting uh, package. In a sense, it has its own scripting language. I say has because it's still in use. So actually, it doesn't have any of these methods that I just described embedded into it. They are written as kind of external scripts, which then are parsed by its own built-in parser and executed using fundamental level commands. So that's a design of Spider. And as you will see, as I go through it, some packages maintain it. A magic was thought of as more modern approach where the user has a little, if any, control over these schematics or flowcharts that I showed at the beginning. This is hardwired mm, uh, by the developer and the user can only control performance by adjustment of parameters. In case of Imagic, it might be a simplification, but I just try to illustrate the idea. So to, I call it a black box approach. Yes, it does something. I can control the behavior, but I cannot modify it short of going to Fortran or C-level um, code and making changes, which due to complexity is all but impossible and can be dangerous. So then we have XMIP, Iman1. XMIP, XMIP is done in Madrid in a group of Jose Maria Carrasso, Iman1, Steve Latke. As you see, these tend to be black box things. The reason is that it actually, it's not that, or wasn't that easy in the 80s or 70s, even when Spider was designed, to put together a scripting mm, part of it, yes, meaning a parser of some kind of a language. Spider has it, and it is an accomplishment by itself, or was, because the parser was actually written in Fortran. So for those of you who still remember Fortran 66, it was an accomplishment. In any case, the, in a sense, a return to this original con concept was made possible by Python. And here you have two coexisting, coexisting in a sense that these are actually versions of the same library, as you will see, which is Sparks, done by my, myself, and Iman2, Steve Latke, which heavily rely on Python. And Python is a very good scripting language. Therefore, it's very easy to write all these protocols that I described in a manner that Mm, uh, that makes it easily understandable to somebody who is not a professional. So again, Sparks is mainly based on, on scripting. I simply built on my uh, experience with uh, Spider, while Iman2, it has scripting um, capabilities. However, Steve generally went into direction of graphical user interfaces, in hope that that would simplify the work of user, but at the same time, it acts as a, well, it, it detaches the user for nuts and bolts of the actual software. So now you see this major division into do all packages, as I call them, and single tasks. These, which I call do all, yes, the first six, can do the whole project as I just described have algorithms implemented that perform all these steps. However, some people simply thought or actually had great idea how to attack a single problem out of this, and the complexity may vary, and I list just a few. So for example, CTF find, which, you've, uh, which you see listed as 2003, does relatively simple task, which is estimation of parameters of the transfer function, which I already showed, or particle picking, which is essentially a correlation approach based on templates to pick up uh, particle images from this invisible field. Yes, some like free align and more recently rely on focus on 3D refinement, which I said mm, is a very complex task and both devel developers here put enormous effort into make it 
more efficient. However, by the very fact that these uh, programs perform was one task, they're essentially black boxes. They're just designed to do one task and they're written as closed, um, closed pieces of code. <clears throat> so Sparks, as I said, it's developed by in my group starting in 2007, maybe slightly earlier, in collaboration with Steve Latke, who essentially came up with the general design. So the idea is that libraries are written in C or C++. Some libraries are written in Python because there will be pieces of, uh, of scripts, yes. It contains simple interactive interface, which is not used very much, by which I mean GUI, we, we don't put much effort into it. Most is done by command line programs. And finally, it relies heavily on MPI parallelization, which when I wrote it was 2007, was a distinction. Now virtually all these packages listed use MPI. <clears throat> so this is the overall organization. I will not spend much time on it. What is really important is that the C++ core, as I say here, we actually don't work on it that much. The reason being is that the fundamental commands were implemented originally, fundamental algorithms, calculation, we rely on FFTW libraries to do Fourier transforms. So all of that is done. And unless we invent something which doesn't happen all that often, we don't look there. Then we have Python libraries, and these are simple scripts which make it sophisticated, the simple commands, and usable for EM. And this is where main of the effort goes. And level three will be the um, much shorter now scripts, say, of the kind that I show of 3D projection refinement that, that, that refines the resolution. And there is associated graphics. So this is the general idea. Now we have documentation, which I'm quite proud of, because not only it provides a lot of know-how, how to deal with the package, what it all means, but it also provides a list of commands. And this I was trying to do, uh, to make useful for somebody with some background in image processing. So I have equations and these are standard things that can be found in image processing textbooks. So why this is not necessarily image processing to toolkit of MATLAB, the idea is somewhere there. So how to use Sparks? These are all line commands, yes. So there is a parser which will take list of parameters and pass them to uh, Python code and eventually to C++ functions. And these are examples. This is this might not be that interesting. The problem here, I have to admit immediately, is that I chose very simple examples. Yes, the actual commands, and you can see the same problem in Iman2 and probably in other packages, that in order to control these complicated procedures, the number of parameters is enormous. This would make actual line command totally incomprehensible. While GUIs are of some help, they're not necessarily very useful because the hierarchy of parameters is not that obvious. What do we really use? Yes, a, a fresh, a novice is, is put in a very difficult position because it's not that obvious what is the minimum set of parameters and how to adjust them. However, in my group and also in groups of collaborators, we have to use Sparks the same way as MATLAB might be used, which is for prototyping of new approaches, some of them which I described. And this is an example of how it looks like. So this is an interactive session. Yes, one would simply type. And here at the bottom, we see A equals filter. This is a Butterworth filter and it has some kind of parameters. So these are obvious, um, obvious things. Yes, this is a simple syntax. The extension of Python that we have is that we introduce images as Python 
object. So A in this case is a Python object, meaning a piece of memory which contains image data and a header information. So what Steve Latke designed is an extension of Python, yes, even though we run Python by importing this Iman2 and Sparks, I increase its capability such that I can operate on images and this is all provided by our software. As I said, a lot of work is done by MPI using MPI parallelization and this is also where major effort goes to. The reason is already in the 90s I originally put a lot of parallelization using shared memory model which was quite common as GI used it and promoted heavily but there was a limitation to it and one couldn't really go beyond 1632 processors. So in starting from late 90s all of that was moved to MPI distributed memory which are simply clusters as we know them. Here one can easily think about hundreds of nodes, hundreds of threads, processes and what I observed early on that most of what we do is really trivially parallelizable and here I'm just showing this uh, schematic which I showed a moment ago which is how projection alignment is done, this projection refinement. Yes, So let's say that we already generated these 2D templates and each node contains all templates and contains a subset of individual particle images, meaning experimental data. Here for simplicity I show that node 0 contains just one particle, node 1 another particle. So now totally independently I can do alignment of this particle to all images and I can do it on each node and it scales linearly. Yes, the more nodes I have, the faster I can do it. And because the number of individual particles can be in hundreds of thousands, if I had hundreds of thousands of CPUs, I would do it as fast as for single particle. So as long as this algorithm is exactly as shown here, meaning primitive, it's very easily parallelizable. Then you see we go out of this green MPI block. So I just gather on one processor all correlation functions, I convert them to correlation coefficients, I convert them to orientation parameters, I send them back to individual nodes and 3D reconstruction, again the code works under MPI because I'm not showing that as you can imagine the back projection step is also independent from one projection image to another so it can be easily parallelized. So as long as the algorithm is as primitive as is shown here it is parallelizable and it works well. So let me jump to challenges just uh, let me just look up the time now yeah I'll finish in about five minutes. So uh, what are the challenges? The main one is time of calculation. So even with all this parallelization, first, current algorithms do more than what I show on this thing. So they don't scale as well as I, as I just said. So they still scale reasonably well, but because number of images is large, as I show here, for example, I participated in projects of one or two million images, yes, so data load is enormous, yes, and because we operate on these images so often, all of that has to be kept in memory, of course distributed between nodes of a cluster, yes. So what I'm showing is that we have to process this enormous volume of data and that takes of course, significant amount of uh, time. The problem is that there is no good way around it, at least not that I can think about. In some kind of future, assuming that methods mature, which is far from happening because the field is still developing and more advanced methods are introduced, what can imagine a dedicated hardware that would deal with it, but this is not happening yet. So just the fact that the, the volume of data is so high, it has to take time. All right. Second problem that I want to touch upon, and this is something somewhat beyond my expertise, but 
uh, that's a problem that always bothered me, which is versatility versus ease of use, which, as I just showed, the scripting package versus black box. Yes, users prefer a black box, something that just works. Yes, and they have as few parameters as possible. However, we have to keep in mind that it would be unusual for two different projects, meaning projects directed at different uh, proteins to be done in exactly the same way. There are always differences, something is different, yes? And the user have, has to have a degree of control and ability to adjust all that. So I will just show one example, why is that so? All packaged methodologies work well as long as the object is structurally consistent by which i mean is just of one kind i will elaborate on it somewhat more so on the left i show a ribosome and what we see here is a compact object it doesn't have any symmetry but we know that it occupies finite space we know what this space is and that methodology for it is developed and can work in a reasonably good way all right further we may have protein or complexes which are symmetric yes by which i mean point group symmetry so if you look closely at it this is the same thing repeated many times over which again methodology for this can be derived from the methodology of the left one we just have to take into account the fact that there are self similarities of the object and that was developed and works reasonably well associated problems and now it's getting difficult are for uh, helical fi filaments so this mathematically speaking means that these object this helis is in principle infinite yes it can extend along its long axis until infinity yes and helical organization as we know means that all of that is composed of a disk yes a 3d disk which normally it's not that tall yes say 20 50 pixels and this disk is then rotated and moved forward yes as you can see on this picture hopefully so actually as soon as we notice it the methodology was developed so we can use only this unique part one disk and regenerate the whole thing and it works reasonably well in each case what i'm pushing is that the principle of the structure is everywhere the same however <clears throat> the methodology does not work that well if we have systems which I would call structurally inconsistent, all right? And this normally calls for some kind of ad hoc method because each case is different and the methodology becomes hybrid. So this is an example of, uh, of a virus capsid. These capsids are very nice because they have very high point group symmetry, uh, icosahedral, meaning 64. For yes, uh, 60 fold. So, uh, this on the right panel, this, this uh, bright ring, this is just a section through it, and this is all information which it has. However, what I wanted to point out that in this particular uh, case, on the left panel, the green stuff does not follow icosahedral symmetry. Yes, as you see, it's attached here and there, and this is what it was was realized during the work on the system and that makes things immediately complicated the reason is that during a refinement process we apply the known point group symmetry but if we do it in this case it will ruin the arrangement of the green stuff as you see on the left and it will smear it second part which is also true in viruses if we look inside we see this concentric white rings this is an artifact interior of the virus virus capsid contains mm, rna rna is not arranged in a icosahedral manner and actual packing might not be mm, uh, might not be general in a sense each virus may have 
slightly different packing. So if we just do reconstruction, we get these concentric rings. And but this is an artifact. I'm not even sure why people show it, because there has no significant uh, significance. So again, if I were to take a generic software, a black box, yes. It will know nothing about this green stuff and the fact that the symmetry is different. And I'm very unlikely, or I would say it's impossible to obtain an example, uh, to obtain a uh, result. Here's another example. This is even more complicated. Yes, this is uh, um, another virus. This shape is looks sort of like a pencil. And again, it has three parts. So it has this conical shape tip then the inner part as we see is organized in a helical manner and then the base is different yet as you can easily imagine for somebody who enjoys programming and image processing it's a great challenge because one would take a scripting package and start writing code taking it apart apply different methods to each part bring it together they cannot be determined totally separately because some kind of information has to pass between them so it's a great computational challenge but again very unlikely to be done by black box uh, software so to close all of that as successful as we are and it is true that nowadays many systems can uh, reach uh, atomic resolution there is still much to be done uh, particularly in software development and the question that i want to leave open here is how to make it accessible to a non-specialist and at the same time allow the user without actually learning c++ to uh, approach these systems which i call structurally inconsistent yes uh, and scripting language of course is great but it might be challenging i was thinking about uh, approaches graphical programming uh, things that represent major steps as simple graphical things which can be arranged on a on a screen uh, to um, to mimic an algorithm and execute it as such. I saw in other fields uh, attempts to do it and I thought it was interesting, but of course it would be a major effort and I'm not very equi well equipped to deal with it, but I wanted to leave, it with, uh, leave this presentation with, um, with this thought that much has to be done, both in terms of efficiency of what exists uh, but also in terms of making it, it uh, easily accessible to non-specialists. So I'll stop at this point. Thank you for um, participation. Great. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, so if anyone has questions, feel free to pass them along in the chat window and I will pass them along. I can, uh, I've got one that I can kick off with here. Um, and you sort of alluded to this already, but it would seem that the Sort of parallel nature of some of the processing algorithms would lend themselves to some sort of dedicated hardware coprocessor. But the uh, I just took a quick Google here on my phone. It looks like the uh, Xeon Phi has eight gigs of RAM for something like sixty simple cores. Um, it looks like that's definitely not going to cut it. Uh, do you see anything on the future? Or are you? So, uh, is that something on the radar of your group that you're talking about, or is it just out of the question right now? I have to say that these things come and go. I remember when I joined the Akims group in 89, there was a lot of excitement because they just obtained a hardware FFT unit, which was attached to a workstation, PTP workstation back then. However, it took about two years to program it, and in the meantime, general purpose <laughs> processors became faster so the project was abandoned i did something similar there was a lot of enthusiasm in the field as far as gpus are concerned yes because they're inexpensive and supposedly very fast we put enormous effort into programming them and there are many papers that one can see however practical impact of it is virtual zilch the reason is that our data doesn't feed them very well. The typical GPU 
is used for a memory for 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 for, for a screen for objects which are 1000 by 1000 our images don't look like that we have thousands of images which are relatively small 128 by 128 so as it turns out and we used a lot of effort mm, communication with gpu makes it so slow that actually it's faster again to process it on a on a generic cpu however as i'm saying we're not really computer specialists so it is possible that somebody could do it better and accomplish something but if we failed it's not for lack of trying so as i said i'm somewhat skeptical that it can be done now but we are very open-minded and hope that something will appear eventually yeah all right uh, yep oh, so, hold on one we have one question here locally hold on one second uh, so i mean i have a i have a software electrical engineering background so i'm trying to understand from the processing point of view you have you, you have this mapping that you want to create between raw images and templates and so you basically try to do this with parallel processing and you said that with one set of images per node it just basically scales up linearly as opposed to exponentially and i'm trying to understand if you processed more images per node or you somehow tried to change that distribution I'm trying to understand why it doesn't why it scales up linearly and not maybe exponentially. I, I I'm not sure I would know how a thing could scale up exponentially. Well, I'm just wondering. I, I I'm basically you're saying you have to map, you have to create a one to one mapping between the, the raw data and every template, right? You have to try every. Uh, yeah, so to put it in simple terms, what, what I meant is that if I have 100 images and 100 nodes, in the, it's done in some kind of unit of time. Right. If I have 1,000 images and 1,000 nodes, it will take the same amount of time. Right. Yeah, right. that's right. what I mean by linear scaling. Okay. okay. I don't know how you could do better than that, to tell you the truth. Yeah, but that's the, I mean, that's the... That's what you say is the major bottleneck, right? In terms of yeah, the, 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 there are two reasons. First, nobody has one thousand nodes, at least not in our fields. Yes, we would have to go to supercomputer centers. And second, even more important, actually, there is a lot of communication in all of that. If you remember, I said one has to gather all these parameters, redistribute them, calculate reconstructions, send the volume back. So one of the elements, hardware elements, which is of great help, is InfiniBand. If we have cluster equipped with InfiniBand, the parallelization can be much more sophisticated. In a sense, more information can be exchanged and algorithms can be improved. But again, as we are all aware, that increases the price dramatically. So the challenge is how to uh, use standard um, connectivity and maybe modify the algorithm. <clears throat> well, with that, I think uh, we'll wrap it up. Uh, thank you very much, Pavel. I'll uh, thank you. follow up with you online, offline. Okay. okay.